in this episode, we hand out Santa's naughty or nice list and what we're on some NHL team's wishes this Christmas. We team ISO the Los Angeles Kings again with their 11s and Dennis Bernstein. We're the Kings core, Doughty, Quick, Kopitar are finding the fountain of youth with the fresh talent coming in. Hit the music. <laughs> Sports Hot. I'm your host, Peter Bojaranov, and the mic is always on. It's your one-stop weekly shop for expert analysis on every single team. We are a fun hockey community bringing everyone together. You can find me on Twitter now at P. Bojaranov. B-O-J-A-R-I-N-O-V. V is in Victor, formerly at Russia 98. You can find the full show at Jablam Sports. That's J A B L A M Sports. If you have any questions or comments, please tweet us. Use the hashtag at Jablam Sports. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so yet and cl- click on those three dots in your podcasting app. Share our show with three hockey fans you know. Thank you, everyone. Remember, check out our website, www.jablamsports.com. For our podcasts and even game notes for each episode, you'll get all the links to everything we mentioned on this show, including guests. We've even got articles this year and much more content weekly. For our podcasts, click on podcasts on our website and then hockey on this show specifically, right on our website. Time for this week's Christmas theme trending. And now on the panel are George Malik. He's the Red Wings blogger at the Malik Report. You can find him on Twitter at George Malik. Welcome to the show, George. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Sweet. And of course, back on the show is Rob Tubb. He's, of course, producer at NHL and News 12 in New York. And of course, co editor in chief. Miles Fix, how you doing, Rob? I'm doing good, Pete. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's It's been an interesting holidays. We all know World Juniors coming up. We're going to talk more about that next week, update everybody on that. But it's holiday time. Let's have some fun. Hmm. We're going to have Santa's naughty or nice list. But first, what are things teams kind of wanted to open and wished for on Christmas Day? Rob, Islanders have any wishes? it's just to not uh, to stop getting COVID. I mean, like that's the lay of the land right now, but no, it's just to, you know, it's to get healthy. And weird thing is, is they were starting to really find their game before the second outbreak hit. And it's just like, it seems like it's just stop and start right now. And I think not having a consistent like flow of things ever since the start of the year has really hurt them. So if there was one thing I think fans and the players and I think Barry Trotz really would have wished for outside of uh, no more COVID cases is just getting a consistent flow of things. It's just been, it's been a very difficult, difficult stretch starting with the 13 game road trip. And then, you know, the COVID hit and then just all the home games. And it's just, it's been a very, very tough time. And yeah. I think that'd be something that uh, we, uh, especially me and a lot of other people would wish for. The Islanders, of course, we all know they were on the long road trip at the beginning and that was tough for them. And now the home cooking of UBS arena hasn't helped as much either i mean it's it's been tough because in the first the first like i'd say five or six games they were without you know 75 percent of their lineup so it's hard to you know create that home ice advantage they've started to create it a little bit as of late you know the they played a, they played a lot better at home they've gotten a few wins uh that game against vegas uh, they they had it and you know vegas is good enough they're tied the game and then they went in the shootout but you know, that's that's another thing. It's just been so freaky about this season. It's just like the way the home schedule worked itself out. And it's just it's been very tough to find consistency. And I, I think that's that probably be another thing on the list of what uh, fans are like. It's for them to create that home advantage 
because that was one of the biggest things coming into this season when they were going into this new building was they were going to have the ultimate home ice advantage because it was going to sound like the Coliseum. It was going to rock like the Coliseum. I won't say that it has just yet, but it, it's been hard with a lot of the just – all the stuff that's going on with the COVID protocols and players being out, it, it's very difficult for them to establish a home ice advantage. They might be able to do it, you know, whenever they get back there. Their, their next game is supposed to be Wednesday against Detroit. So uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how things uh, play out from here. George, on your side of things, uh, what are the Red Wings wishing for? Well, first and foremost is obviously health. They've got, uh, I believe the number went down from 10 players in the COVID protocol down to eight. Uh, which is great given that they were they were somewhere between 12 and 14, including both the head coach, uh, Jeff Blashill, and assistant coach Alex Tange, which still sounds weird to say, but okay. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, I would say the road record. I'm looking at, uh, at ESPN's home and road split right now, and at, at um, Little Caesars Arena, the Red Wings are 11-3-2. and two. And away from uh, Little Caesars Arena, they are 4, 10, and 1. And so definitely would like to see a road record improve uh, significantly um, if the Red Wings are to remain relevant. And we're not necessarily looking for a playoff run, you know, uh, from this team, given that they've played in so many games. Uh, For example, the Boston Bruins have a a couple games in hand on them, and just about every NHL team has some games in hand. But... Uh, the fact that they're even in a conversation as being in a wild card spot is really nice uh, after, especially after the last couple of years. So health and a better road record. Yeah, they are uh, quite a delight across the league. And those young guys on uh, Detroit, like Raymond and uh, Cider on the back end looks phenomenal. I know uh, being here in the, the GTA general Toronto area, of course, everybody knows across the league, the Leafs, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, are wishing for to get out of the first round. I think that's what everybody is like. Is that even possible? I believe it's possible, and I'm going to put it out there right now. I think they're going to get out of the first round. Of course, like you guys mentioned, injuries is a big thing, and it has been on the Leafs. Last year, they had guys that were banged up. Zach Hyman, Nick Foligno, and even Austin Matthews were banged up going into the playoffs. And then with an injured Jake Muzzin not playing many of games, and of course... The captain, John Tavares, you guys know, uh, him being out in that vicious hit, that just it mentally took the to Leafs out of that series. So if they can avoid those injuries, think, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, Pete, like, that is that should be the number one wish yeah. on, the, on Toronto Maple Leaf fans list. You know, they're, they're, they become like the, the fodder for jokes when it comes to them not getting out in the first round. But yeah. I think more than them having health, it's always it's going to come down to goaltending. Mm. Are you really going to trust Jack Campbell to get you out of the first round? And you made some good points, you know, last year that they were mentally out of it once Tavares uh, went down. But yeah. it all also, you know, goaltending. If you can get a hot goaltender in the playoffs, it could take you could take you places, and it could take you all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. We've seen it, you know, in a bunch of a bunch of times over the past few years. But I think it also depends on the matchup with them because yeah. there are teams that could be a very let's say they get Detroit. Detroit uh, has a lot of speed, has a lot of youth, some inexperience, but they've also they've got two goaltenders who have won pl- who have played well in playoff series before. Adelkovich, I know he played Carolina last year, and I know they ran into the Tampa Bay Lightning, but you know there's nothing you could do about that. He played he played his ass off, and then you got Thomas Christ, who's won playoff series before with the Islanders, and he's been on teams that have won two, like with the Penguins mm-hmm. and with the Sharks. So he has experience in that department that could really help you know, a possible upset, but I, I just don't know if I trust Jack Campbell to, you know, take them, you know, all the way to the promised land and it's even getting out of the first round. Cause as, as we've seen in the past, like once you, the Leafs can be up three, one in a series and they just don't know how to close it out. Yeah. They really don't know how to close out series. And that's one of their biggest bugaboos. And if they get there, they, cause they should be a playoff team. They should yeah. be a playoff team again. They're that good. And they have a, so they have so much talent from Matthews on down so I think those are the two things that you should be wishing for if uh, you're a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Yeah, you're t- hitting the n- nail on the head there. Uh, I think, and we've seen, Freddie aronerson has been a phenomenal top 10 goaltender during the regular season, but he's always been beaten 
when it comes to the playoffs. It doesn't matter who's... I will say Yeah. I will say the team in front of him this year, I think is more balanced than the Leafs have been in all his years he was there in Toronto. Carolina is they're stacked from top to bottom. Defensively, they're one of the best in the league. Offensively, yeah. they got guys who can hurt you from all different angles. And they and then you have Anderson who's you know what? He, that's a big thing when it comes to playing in the playoffs. It's you've got guys who have struggled over the years and they get another chance and another and another destination. They get there. And they have a great season, and then they have something even more to prove in the playoffs. And that's what I—I I think that could be Freddie Anderson this year, if uh, depending on who Carolina plays in the first round. Yeah, uh, I think obviously with the Leafs, if they match up poorly, and again, I think it's those hardworking teams like the Blue Jackets, like the Islanders, and even the Boston Bruins—they don't match up very well. So that's what they got to be wishing for. Uh, on the naughty list, George. Uh, who's on the naughty list? Brandon Lemieux. <laughs> if you don't bite Good another choice. guy. Great choice. I mean, and, and we're coming from, I'm coming from Detroit where, where we have quite the, the feud still with Brandon Lemieux's father, um, <laughs> player Claude. agent, Claude Lemieux now. But I mean, my God, what a, what a doof. <laughs> That's saying it lightly. That is saying it lightly. I mean, and he's got a he's got a reputation as as a, as a loose loose cannon at best. Um, I mean, when when people hate you in Winnipeg, I mean that that's bad. Uh, mm-hmm. I I have relatives in Winnipeg who are who are hockey fans, and and so the the Jets have always been sort of my second team. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they hated him in Winnipeg. I've been told they just absolutely despised him when he was with the Moose and. Winnipeg is one of the most kind and welcoming towns in all of Western Canada. And to, to, to be absolutely despised by the, the hockey loving fans in Winnipeg. Ooh, that, that's, that's a bad sign. And, and, and apparently it's, he's not, not the only place where he's worn out his welcome. So, mm-hmm. you know, Brendan Lemieux, you don't bite a guy. <laughs> uh, yeah. With that. Brady Kachuk had was pissed off with that with his post game po- conference. Um, I was hey, I don't know about you with the Jets fans. I was at a Sabres game, and this is the Sabres we're talking about. The fan the fans love their team, even death to till part. But there was Jets fans, and they just started turning around with this offensive team a couple years ago. And I was like, wow, they're pretty rowdy, and they were like giving it to Sabres fans. I'm like, how? mean do you have to be to give it to Sabres fans with the, what they've had to deal with with this that organization and everything that they were like chirping them and everything I was like wow really take it easy take it easy your team is obviously doing better these days than before but you don't have to take it out on Sabres fans Rob yeah I, yeah I, go I, ahead I agree with you yeah I know I agree with you that that they can be pretty mouthy when it comes to hockey uh, usually mm-hmm. they're polite Manitobans but yeah. you know get them in a hockey rink and it's, it's trash talk the whole way. And, and as somebody from a, another city, you kind of cringe a little bit and go, you know, cheer for your team, you know, give them, give them uh, some positive energy, but, but don't go chirping the crowd. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not, especially when you're in a home rink, you know, you hear the, that's like hearing a Blackhawks fan come to um, little Caesars arena and start chanting red wings suck, you yeah. know, you know, that, uh, s- slow down there, partner. <laughs> oh, man. I was at uh, Patrick Kane and Jonathan Tate's first NHL game. And boy, that opening game of the season was phenomenal with the rivalry that is between those two teams. Uh, Rob, who's on your naughty list? Well, I was going to say, Claude, I was going to say <laughs> Brendan Lemieux because that was like, that yeah. was a low hanging fruit because everyone talks about him. Um, I think the suspensions, I think the, I think a lot of these guys, like a lot, there's been so many suspensions since mm-hmm. the year started. And I think a lot of it is, you know, it's give and take, like depending on, you know, whether it's a good or a bad call, but I think that there's players right now um, that like, I don't know, if, uh, like, um, for example, like a PK Subban, like I think a lot of the, like uh, a lot of the backlash he's getting with, you know, some of the, some of the, things he's done with uh with his skate like uh with the um what are what's the thing with the skate that uh, Mm -hmm. the slew foot you know some of them you know i i I don't want to say like that they were his fault like that he was doing on purpose but 
you know, it's like little things like that. And just there's, there's certain things that are like that have gone on this year that just haven't, you know, haven't been a great look for the game. I'm not going to get into specifics, but definitely the, the slew foots and some of the suspensions have just been like, just completely ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that they weren't deserved, but I think that some of them just have been like, just not the greatest look for the, not the greatest look for, you know, the way the game has gone this year, especially with all the other crap that the, the league is dealing with uh, when it comes to like the health and safety of the players. Uh, for my, uh, yeah, for myself, I'm going to go with the IHF and, uh, you know, stop in the women's hockey. Uh, I mean, it's been tough with everything going around in the world, but seriously, it's just not a good time and not a good look. If you're letting the other leagues and teams and tournaments go, uh, I don't think that's the correct thing to do and the correct move to go with and suspending the women's hockey tournament. Uh, it's just not right. And you got to let them play and you and you, you got to let them showcase what they can do because there's a lot of talented women hockey player out there players out there and they totally deserve to be in the limelight and showcase I'll, their game i'll be i'll be completely honest and i agree with you uh pete on who you picked i will say this i think that the women the women's level yep. is severely better it's completely better than what we're going to see at from the olympics with the usa men's team yeah i mean honestly like as as sad as that might sound the women's team, the U.S. women's team is just so much more competitive than what the USA has been throwing out there the past few years. Being an American, uh, I think, like, you know, we haven't seen a great, like, U.S. men's hockey team in a long time, but the women have just been, like, rolling, like, since for the past, like, 10 years, always in gold medal games, always in big events. So I, I'm with you where the, the IAHF is on the naughty list. And it's also just the fact that it has nothing to even do with the women. It's just like, it's not a great look for the game either. Yeah. Like you have, you have women, women's hockey, which is trying to really, really push themselves to the forefront, uh, like out there and, you know, having them cancel the tournament again uh, for the second year in a row, just, just awful. And just not, just not great in general. Yeah. Like I really, really want to see what Matthews and Connor McDavid and the rest of the, the new generation of the U.S. team is going to look phenomenal, and they're going to keep getting better. And the Matthews, true. And Matthews and McDavid are going to look great, and it sucks that we can't see them. But Brooklyn Decker, Amanda Kessel, Marie, uh, Marie Poulin, like the rivalry between Canada Hillary, and the Hillary USA. Knight, Hillary Knight, like all of them. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And am I going to be entertained by watching Ca Team Canada and McDavid destroy China? No. I'm not. I'm not going to enjoy that game. It's going to be like, eh, whatever. But to see those women play and what they can do and that rivalry, nothing beats that. Nothing beats them and the games between those two teams. All right. Agreed. I mean, it's it's the top of the – It's for me, for the women's hockey, it's the top of the heap versus the bottom of the heap still. Um, I think that, you know, there, there's still – another level that that the women's game can can rise to in terms of its its entire um competitive balance but but again that's something where you look at like the, the world under 18s that just got canceled and you say well that's a tournament where if you want to develop players you want you want them to play not only best on best you want them to play each other um and and you want them to get that experience and and not being able to give those those young ladies that experience is it's just unfortunate it, it's really disappointing because there are so many of us that are fans of the women's game as well as the men's game you know it's 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 different but different doesn't mean bad different different just means that there's not as much physical physicality because there's to checking is is technically illegal you know um but I, I just feel I feel so bad for them that, that two years in a row that, that they haven't been able to, to, to do that. It, it's it's just unfortunate. And and like you guys are saying, the I double IHF is, is chasing the money. You know, we all know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's finish with some nice players. And uh, I actually wanted to say on my my wish list uh, and continuing on that theme there is I wish. 
we had more of those tournaments, but I also wish there was an NHL Champions League. I've always wished that. I think, like we said, during the World Juniors, during these tournaments, we get to see the best on best, and players bring out their best quality, and they get better. During playoffs games, during these tournaments, they get better. Their level rises. So when you play more of talented, top talented players, the cream of the crop rises, and they get better. In the Champions League, man, they would all get better, and it would be awesome to see like the top Stanley Cup winning team and then a host team that's very good and then maybe some top teams from other leagues play against them as well and it would raise their levels and maybe maybe we get more like soccer and we start borrowing players from t- renting uh renting the best players for temporarily it's, it's almost a little bit like the equivalent of what the nhl did like 20 years ago when they had the all-star game where it was the usa you know it was north america versus the world mm. which would be Kind of, it's kind of a little bit of the same concept. It's a little different. I, yeah. I will admit that, but like it, it's it's almost the it has a like an exact type of um, like a feel, like the same type of feel that yeah. you're you're kind of like this the champ like a champion league. Yeah, you totally would. I think I could see a, a very easily a, a under twenty five team versus an over twenty five team, for example, mm-hmm. um, because you know. Uh, People are are still raving about about Team North America uh, from from the from when they actually had the World Cup. So that'd be fun to see to see the youngest players and see what they could do against against uh, on uh, God God forbid that, that you could start calling people who are twenty five and old or old, but you know and uh, more advanced players. Let's go with that. Yep. Uh, so on my. Uh, nice players list, and I want to see more of him. And it's Trevor Zegers. Zegers is awesome. Uh, phenomenal talent. He already has 25 points in 30 games. But the passing ability and the highlight reel plays that he creates, I want to see more and more of him. And he is nice. He deserves more. And I want to see more of Zegers. Uh, he's amazing. He's outstanding. And he's great for the league. Uh, Rob, who's on your nice list? Um, I was going to go with Zegris. I will admit I was going to go with Zegris. I, I, I wanted to stick with the theme because we do have a, like a Red Wings blog. I want to say Lucas Raymond. I feel like. Go ahead he, and take him. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, I, I love watching him play. I've uh, been, you know, been fortunate enough, you know, cover, cover a few games for the NHL watching him just a while, like have the, having to be assigned to it. But he's just like, he's a, like a lightning rod and he's just so damn good. And he's so fun to watch. And he can like hit the, he can rip a shot from anywhere and it can be dangerous. So I like uh, Lucas Raymond to me deserves a lot more. And I, he's been just a, one of the best like additions to the league this year. Watching him play has been, it's been a real treat. Oh man. You're saying I, I want to see more of Raymond, but I think Marit Sider looks phenomenal and I can't wait. To see he was his, my second. Yeah. I can't wait. to <laughs> see my second choice. I that's wait. my pick. Yeah. That, that's my pick. I hate to, I hate to Detroit dominate things, yeah, but yeah, I mean, but it's all right. He's such a mature defenseman for, again, we're, we're talking about age versus maturity here, but I mean, for, for, for 19 years old going on 20, what vision of, of the game, you know, what anticipation he, you know, coach Blashell always talks about um, the concept of, of knowing what you're going to do before the pucks on your stick so that you, that you work on instinct and, and instead of thinking all the time. And that's what cider does is, is that he knows what he's going to do before the pucks on his stick. He sees the ice so well, um, uh, you know, and, and there is just a hint of physicality to his game that really intrigues Red Wings fans that miss their Nicholas Cronwall. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there were some big hits that he laid out in the in the Swedish Hockey League last year um, that, that were just tremendous. And, and to to see all of the elements of his game slowly come together, I, I became a Red Wings fan around the time that Nicholas Lidstrom and Vladimir Konstantinov came in and. I I'm, I feel the same way for the first time in almost 30 years that I'm watching a really great player start to develop. 
you know, and, and being able to watch the, those, 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 those baby steps be, and, and not be taken as baby steps, but be taken with, with confidence and poise. And, 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 and I, I hate to use the word again, but I'm going to say with a lot of resolve, if not some swagger, you know, that that's incredibly exciting. And, and again, down here in Detroit, where we've, we've been, heavy into the rebuild for a couple of years now to, to, to be coming up with guys like Lucas Raymond and, and Moritz Sider. It's so much fun. And we haven't had any fun in a long time. Hey, I, I, I would even entertain this city that hasn't had much fun in, in many moons. So <clears throat> it's been rough in Detroit for three, four years, but it's been a lot harder in some, some areas. All right. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you can do find them on Twitter. We... Go ahead, Rob. I was going to say, do we get a second? Nice, yeah, go uh, ahead, Rob. Uh, who's who's also on your uh, nice uh, list? Oh, more Connor McDavid goals. Mm. Like, uh, I mean, just some of the some of the goals he scored this year, just absolutely incredible. And anytime he's on my television, I'm immediately glued. And I wish we didn't just get to see him once in a while on TNT or whatever you got, like you guys are lucky up there in Canada. You guys get to see him all the time. I don't know if you do Pete, even though you're in Toronto, but yep. it's like just getting to watch him. is just a total, it's, it's a total pleasure because he is just, he's an absolute beast. And every, like just anytime he's on the ice, like you can't not take your eyes off of him the same way, the same, the way, same kind of way Ovechkin is where when you, when he steps on the ice, you immediately follow what he's doing and it's just it's been a pleasure to watch him just continue to dominate and just be an absolute stud yeah you're totally right mcdavid is above and beyond better than anything we've seen in the nhl before with what he can do zegris zegris is very creative and he's a very different on that aspect but mcdavid just controls the game overall and his speed that he and the speed that he can do all his talented skill while going at top speed is phenomenal and it's tough the last year or so has been tough on everybody but on a good note Canadians did get to see more of McDavid overall the last year with the Canadian division but it sucked because you couldn't see I couldn't get to see Colorado and Vegas and some of the other young talent across the league as much last season so it's been tough for all of us but I'm wishing everybody a happy new year and a phenomenal get healthy, stay safe for everybody. Again, you can find them on Twitter at our Tov underscore for Rob and for George at George Malik. Next up, we have Team ISO LA Kings. The future for them obviously looks bright, but who shines the brightest? We'll find out in mere moments. Have you ever wanted a one-stop weekly shop for expert analysis on every single NHL team? Look no further than JablamSports.com. We've had guests from James Sapolsky, Art O'Cal, and yes, even Dennis Bernstein shows up monthly. We are a fun hockey community bringing everyone together. Find us wherever you get your podcast and type in J A B L A M Sports. That's Jablam Sports. Our website is, yes, you've called it, jablamsports.com. Go download and subscribe right now. You can also find us on socials at Jablam Sports on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm Peter Rojernov saying, puck you later. For this week's Team ISO, we are isolating the Los Angeles Kings. Both back on the show are Daryl Evans. He calls games, of course, for the LA Kings. And scored, in my opinion, one of the biggest goals in Kings history. If you want to know more about that, you can check out from Season 6, Episode 10, where I go all goo-goo gaga on that. Remember that one, Daryl? It's never a bad thing. <laughs> I like to see you when you goo-goo gaga. And, of course, you can find him on Twitter, at Daryl Evans 15 I was actually thinking about that the other day. Uh, you and your beauty suits, especially when you were on the air. Um, Daryl, uh, is there any moment, I'm picturing you in doing medial tasks and still looking gorgeous and marvelous. Is there any medial tax, tasks you ever done in a beautiful suit? Yeah, I've driven a Zamboni. I've been on the public ice skating in, in a suit. Uh, 
I've shoveled, I've, I've done gardening in a suit. I mean, you name it. I mean, suit, suit you can use for everything. I mean, it's, it's multi-purpose. <laughs> it's not the suit, it's the person in the suit. It sure is, and you're a beauty in the suit for sure. Also back on the show is Dennis Bernstein. He's on the hot stove on Sirius XM. You can find him on Kings of the Podcast as well, covering the Kings. And DB, you can find him on Twitter, of course, uh, Dennis Bernstein FTP. You've been on the show five, six times now, I think. And tell him what he's won, Jim. Well... Uh, on the show, uh, on our website, we're going to ha- we'll be opening up the store in, in a couple months. Uh, you'll be able to, people will be able to shop on our website, grab Jablam Sports stuff. But for our amazing media p- personalities that are always on the show, if you've reached five or more times, my team will create a hockey card image. Of course, Daryl probably already has one. But a Jablam Sports hockey card image, and my team will make one and send one to DB. Thank you, DB, for being on the show over five times now. Thank in you other words, much. DB is yeah. trying to yeah. say the check's in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, Chop. Yeah, exactly. It's great. I, I want to have a hockey card, considering I can't even skate, and so I'm probably the least qualified of all people to talk about analyzing hockey games. But uh, great to be with you. I'm waiting for Dow to run a 10K in a suit. I'm not sure that's ever happened, but hopefully at some point in time it will because he is just one of the best, most generous guys. I know a lot about this game because of talking to guys like that. He's been always generous with his time, always stops and gives me tips on what it was like to watch a game as a player, and it, it certainly helped me in my career. God bless, young man. All right, let's get to some Kings talk, of course. That's why you guys are here. Before we dive deep into the team and how they're doing, First off, let's go with the theme that we've been doing so far in the show and trending now. Christmas time, we've all shut down. We've taken some time, spent some more time with our families. But with the Kings players, gentlemen, who on the team has been on Santa's naughty list? Who hasn't scored a goal for a while? Maybe that's who's on the naughty list. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, You know what? I think think when you look at the Kings players – They've done a really good job. It's a young team, uh, you know, coming forth. Uh, so there's a lot of young guys that are being ed- uh, schooled by the old guys, and they're in good hands when you're in the likes of hands of Dustin Brown, Andre Kopitar, Jonathan Quick, and Drew Doughty. You know those kids are going to be brought into the game, into the NHL the right way. So I'm going to put everybody on a nice list. I, I think the one guy that needs to not – pick up his game, but pick up his productivity would be Dustin Brown. And I think he's got, what, three goals? Not for lack of trying. He, I think he leads the team or he's second in the team in shots. Um, they just not hit the back of the net. And so if he could come through, because his team continues to struggle to score five on five, if he can get back on track to the player he was scoring-wise last season, he had 17 goals and 56 games. I don't think he'll hit that clip this year. But a little bit more offense from Dustin um, in the final, what, 52 games will certainly – um, go a long way to keep the Kings in the run for the uh, playoff spot. So I think that would be the one guy I would look at that not, again, doesn't need to pick up his game, just pick up his productivity. In terms of a wish list, somebody who was hoping for something for Christmas, what do you think is something that the, the Kings are hoping for to uh, open up a couple of days ago on Christmas Day, Daryl? I think they want to open up uh, a little bit of good health and, uh, you know, and uh, it coming into the, you know, the rest of the remainder of the season uh, for the, you know, the team and it's, you know, everybody surrounded around the team and including the, you know, the people that are playing against, uh, you know, for everybody to stay healthy and be able to re- resume the NHL as we know it, uh, you know, people to be able to come to events, uh, interact with the players more and engage. I, mean, I think that would probably be in, you know, on everybody's wish list to uh, kind of get back to where we were a couple of years ago. We're slowly getting there. And I think that would be something that everybody would like. For me, I, I think the fountain of youth that Jonathan Quick is drinking out of, like they should replenish that at least a couple of times more before the end of the season. Cause he's been just, he, he's been the guy that won the Jennings trophy in 2018. He's been that good. And he had more run support. You look at his one-loss bucket, he'd win. He would certainly have more wins under his belt, but now the team, you know, 5 2 and 1 in the last eight. And John is clearly the number one in LA right now. So, whatever John's drinking for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, the Kings are saying Casey's over uh, to his house uh, for the rest of the season. Yeah, Daryl, going off on that, how do you think that some of these core players, and we're going to go into them, uh, including Quick, 
have why have the, this this whole thing what's going on why are they all like sipping from the same water i guess well, I'll start with Jonathan Quick, and I know a lot of people wrote him off a couple of years ago. They said he was done. Uh, I've always been a big fan and a big supporter of Jonathan Quick. I still think he's got a lot left in the tank. And I said, even going back a couple of years ago, even before this season started, as this team becomes more competitive, watch for Quick's game to get back to the level where we're all accustomed to see him play. It's not from lack of effort that he's not engaged and hasn't been there the last couple of years. But now the young defense that he's had in front of him, they're getting a good understanding of what they have behind him, what he's capable of doing, what allow him to, you know, how him to allow him to be able to see a shot, uh, setting pucks up in behind the net. Jonathan Quick is one of the most competitive guys I've ever seen in the game. His practice, his work ethic is incredible out there. And he's, he's uh, you know, one of those guys that if he wasn't a, a goaltender, he'd probably be a captain or an assistant captain on his team. He's a, le- he's a leader by example. And you can never take away his compete level, uh, his athleticism. It's been there. We've seen it for so many years. Anybody that's watched the Kings consistently, very seldom you see him have an off night. And he'll be the first one to own up to it. He puts the team first. And it's nice to see now that he's got a little bit of support in front of him. The more support he gets, the better he's going to get. And he's going to be tougher to beat. The opposition that they're playing against right now, they know they're looking at Jonathan Quick from a couple of years ago. And that scares the hell out of them. Uh, The team is... Seventh in the league in goals against. Quick is in the top seven in save percentage with a point nine three zero, and the only gentleman, of course, the elder statesman, to be over thirty two in the top fifteen. So he's playing phenomenal, and we'll go with the core and we'll continue it with it in the back end. The team obviously looks good. Uh, Drew Doughty has thirteen points in the few games that he's only played eleven. He's never been even close to being a point-per-game player. DB, why is Giroux playing phenomenal as well? Well, I think out of the box, the motivation was people were writing him off, like Daryl said, with Quick, and he wanted to make the Olympic team. Mm -hmm. So I think right out of the box, that was it. And again, Daryl talks about John's competitiveness, but who's more competitive than Drew Daryl? Like, and he took this stuff. He came in with a huge chip on his shoulder, probably the size of... Well, now it used to be Staples Center. Now it's Crypto.com <laughs> Arena. But he, he he was really on a mission to prove people wrong, that he was done, he was over, he's overpaid, whatever. And he's been – and again, I think Daryl hit the, the nail on the head. This is a better team. It's as simple as that. They're more competitive. Like Daryl knows. He, he watches every game. He's calling every game. There were some games last year. They went down 2 nothing five minutes in. Game over. Not now. Not this team. So I think it's just – it's like a, a rising tide that rises all ships. I think Drew's better because the team's better. Granted – he missed, you know, six to eight weeks. He missed eight weeks with the knee sprain. He was on the COVID list. But again, he's not doing anything unusual. It's just that he's got better players around him. So his his point totals, granted it's a small sample size, has improved. So again, it's like it's not like the old Drew never left. It's Drew played with tremendous players when he won the cup. The team went to a rebuild. And now as they get better, Drew's gotten better. So again, and he wants to lead. He he burns just like Jonathan Quick does. And that's the one thing when you have championship players that knows how to win, they know how to get back to that level. So it's not about approach. It's not about their their mentality. It's about, you know, who their teammates are right now. Yeah, I don't think anybody thought the Kings would even be a .550 winning percentage team. 11, four, uh, 14, 11, and 5. They are just a couple of points out of the wild card spot. Uh, but continuing on the back end, Daryl, who else has been a standout for you? Well, I think there's a lot of guys that have, you know, taken their game to another level. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start up. I'll run through a couple of them. You look at, uh, you know, Mikey Anderson. Uh, he's had the great luxury of playing with Drew for, you know, a, quite a bit of time over the last couple of years. Uh, he seems to continue to keep maturing and, because of the circumstances that the blue line has gone through this year, he is now kind of handing off some of that to some of the young guys that are coming in and maybe not necessarily have played as many games as him. So I see his game getting to another level. I still think there's a little bit more offense in his game that will eventually come out. Uh, Right now he's really working on playing a complete game, taking care of his own zone as he should do as a defenseman. And uh, I think, uh, like I say, I think his game will continue to keep growing. Uh, Bjornfoot, I think he's taken his game to another level. We've seen at different times that he gets very involved offensively in the offensive zone off the rush. Uh, I think he can contribute a little bit more from back in the blue line. And with that confidence, the experience, 
and learning the league a little bit, he'll continue to grow in that area. Uh, unfortunately, they lose Walker. You know, Walker was a player that was kind of, you know, maybe a step, you know, past them. Uh, now looking to pass some of that on to the young guys. So they're going to miss his offense. Uh, he had the ability to be able to take the puck up the ice. You know, Matt Roy, you know, consistent, you know, Swiss Army knife, uh, you know, play him in all situations. I think Edler was a great addition of the hockey club. Unfortunately, they lost his services. Uh, even most recently, Ole Mata, I think, with the chances that he got, he was starting to contribute. So I think, again, it all comes down, as you know, as, as Dennis was saying, and, you know, we, we've mentioned many times, collectively as a group, this team has gotten better. Uh, they've also changed their identity. Not, they've, not that they've clearly established it yet, but they're looking to become more offensive-minded type of team, more of an attack team more of a possession team. You go back to the team that won the Cups. It was dump it in the trenches and then just go in there and grind the daylights out of you, get the puck back, and somehow put that square peg into a round hole and get a goal out of it. Well, they still have trouble scoring goals, but their the capability, the potential to score more goals is greater than it's been in a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And we're slowly starting to see that. You look at, uh, you know, um, Kaliev, you know, not that he's got a lot of goals, but when you look at the limited amount of ice time that he's played in, the role that he plays it, where he's in in the lineup, he's starting to contribute a little bit. Uh, you know, Grundstrom's chipped in with a few goals. You know, even Kapari and these type of guys. So I think as everybody continues to keep kind of growing their spot, these young guys, their points back in the blue line are going to be uh, a, a little bit more uh, noticeable. And that includes Drew Doughty as well. Drew's always played on a team that hasn't scored a lot of goals. So you wonder why he hasn't been a point of game type of guy. Well, they really weren't a team that was scoring a lot of goals. As this team knocks on the door, becoming a three goal team each night, Drew's numbers are going to go up because he plays in all the critical situations. He's a quarterback on the power play. His numbers will go up as will the rest of the defenders. But the blue line is starting to solidify itself. It's a more of an agile, more movement back in the blue line. Kind of fits today's NHL, uh, you know, whereas before it was a, is a shutdown type of a defense. But you shut down in a different way now. You shut down with hockey sense and skating ability and getting yourself into the right spots. And I think the young guys that the Kings have back in the blue line, you look at the addition of Jersey that just came up a few weeks ago, what he's been able to contribute. He's that kind of today's NHL type of player, contribute offensively. He's got good legs, play the power play. And, uh, if he does make a mistake, he's got the legs to be able to recover. So uh, good things looking, uh, looking for the Kings from back in the blue line. I think a little bit more contribution will come as these players get a little bit more uh, mature and get some more experience playing games. Continuing on that theme with the young guys, that rookie group, there's a lot of them. Uh, Kaliev, to, uh, you know, second round pick in 2019. Kupari, uh, first round pick. And you mentioned Sean Deruzzi as well, second round by Toronto, and then the trade for, with the Muzzin trade coming over, as well as Tkachev and Strand. Uh, DB, you can continue on that theme. Why has Deruzzi, and he yeah. touched base on it a little bit over there, six points in 12 games. He's looked phenomenal so early in his career. He, he knew he's not a quarterback, and he has those offensive instincts that some of the other players like Anderson and Bjornford haven't developed yet. But he's that type of player, but he's not, you know, he's not 6'2 and 220 either. He's, you know, he's 5'10, 190, you know, so he's going to, that's his MO. That's what he got. And you need that. You need that. And that's what Sean Walker gave them on the third pair. And then basically, Jersey's replaced Sean Walker. So I think that that's part of the issue. And I agree with Chapa on Kaliev. You know, Kaliev, you talk about development. Like, I think the best development story this year is Kaliev because as Chop mentioned, I think he's got what six goals. He's got six goals, but he's playing 12 minutes a night. So if you forecast that over 82 games, that's from the fourth line. It's going to score 15. If you're getting 15 from the fourth line next season, you're ready to graduate, right? And be that 20 goal scorer. Let's say on the top six. So to me, that's a really, really good success story. And you look at the numbers, and the surprising thing to me, six goals, but only two on the power play. You know what Arthur's biggest challenge is? Shooting the puck enough. Like he doesn't shoot enough. Like if he's getting in a position where it's a he should be thinking about passing. I know people say, oh, his passing is underrated. I don't care. Like, shoot the puck. I mean, this is a kid who I think has really, like, fit in, is still learning the game as Chop knows. He's got a long way to go. But I think from an offensive standpoint, from this team that's going to be challenged to score, that's what you want from your development. You know, he's not scoring 15 at the halfway point on the fourth line. He plays 12 minutes a night. But, again, he has enough offensive skill and talent to say, okay, I can protect this guy next season to be that 20-plus goal scorer on the top six. 
the and you talk about the offense it's it's slowly coming there and it's probably going to continue in the following seasons but going on that core theme here they're all re- been rejuvenated that includes Anje. he's almost a point of game player we haven't seen him be a point of a game player since 2017 Evans Daryl what's been phenomenal about uh Anjay's game well when you look at Kopitar I think right from day one He's been Mr. Consistency, and he always puts the team first. Uh, there's no doubt on teams or even on the team that he's on right now, he could put up bigger numbers, but he always puts the end result before his own personal numbers, and that's having the team succeed. Uh, as, you know, at the beginning of the season, got off to a great start, and, of course, when you play against the opposition, he draws the top checking line of every team that they play against. So, you know, they got to find a way to get the job done. Now, you bring into him, let's say, a Kaliev that we've just been talking about. You give him, whether or not we see it this year, maybe in the next season, you put Kaliev on a wing like that with your top playmaking centerman, and you tell him you want him to shoot the puck like Ovechkin. The last game the Kings and the Capitals played together, Ovechkin had 16 shot attempts. Now, if Kaliev takes that mentality to the game and getting the feeds in the positions that he's going to get with, like a guy like Kopitar, believe me, he's going to score goals a lot more consistently. You're going to start seeing him score 25, 30 goals in the NHL. And, and that'll be a great thing. Um, but Kopitar, his consistency throughout his career, not only from the offensive side of things, but the defensive side of things, he's still the guy you put on the ice. You've got a one goal lead. He's your lockdown guy. You need a goal. He's the guy you put on the ice. He's going to compliment everybody, make them all better out there. Never cheats the game. He takes so much pride in playing a complete 200-foot game right from the face-off circle. That's when the puck goes down, continuously stays over 50% in that regard. Sure, he has a couple of off nights here and there, but he also has a couple of nights where he's 70 and 80%. He's the type of guy that you want on your team, and especially on a young team. He sets a great example. He's a great role model for these young players to aspire to be like. That's what a professional does on a day-to-day basis. You look in the book, you look up the description in the dictionary, you'll see Andre Kopitar's face right there. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that, uh, PB, because the, the one benefit that guys like me and Daryl have by being at the game, like we watch Kopi away from the puck. Like you can't do that on TV because the TV follows the puck. You watch all the things he does away from the puck. Like he's just, his IQ is off the charts. He knows where the puck is going. He anticipates so well, and it puts him in position to make plays. Like you don't see that. You know, watching the game, you, you just don't. And that's what I marvel at, right? Look, look, he's always a pass first guy. He, he's unselfish, so he's not going to shoot first. I get it. I understand. He's not going to be a 40 goal scorer. He could, when he lets that shot go, Chopper's seen it. Like it, it's one of the best, but that's not his game, right? He gets his assists and he gets his points. But to me, and it's funny, they signed Dano and you figure, okay, Kopi's numbers, are gonna, minutes are going to go down because they've been taxing. The team hasn't been good. They've had to throw him out there. Kopi's playing the same amount of time. So, you know, that, that Todd is leaning on this guy because he's that good. So you got to throw out that stuff because you know what? Yeah, he could score more goals, but he's also a Selkie candidate every season. So that's part of it as well. It's keeping the puck out of the net. You mentioned your seventh in, in goals against. You think Kopitar has something to do with it and filled it out? Of course they do. Hey Amen. And another thing, when you look at Kopitar too, you talk about maybe being rejuvenated and things like that. This last couple of years, pays benefit to guys like Kopitar and Dustin Brown, not having played as many games. That allows you to be able to stretch your career a little bit. Most recently, go back, uh, you know, not most recently, but a few years back, Tay Mussolini was a recipient of that as well. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, lockouts and things like that, they get some time off, whether it be through injury, and all of a sudden they're playing for a couple more years beyond where people thought they would be playing and still be effective. And I think that's the case with Kopitar. He can play as long as he wants. He's always going to have a role, an impact on a team. He inspires and motivates his teammates. And he's a great go-to between the coaches and and the players. Yeah, it sounds like maybe Ovi has been sipping on that as well for not having to play as many games, but looks like he continues to look phenomenal. And obviously he's chasing Gretzky. Uh, One last thing before you guys go. Uh, DB, Adrian Kempe, I wanted to mention him. He's the one that has been shooting, and Andre uh, maybe hasn't been. He already has 12 goals. Yep. Is he going to hit 30 this year? Well, the coach thinks to think he can. He never said it. I've asked him. Um, 
look, he's always and and Darren, he's always had the tools. No question. Yep. The, the yep. size, the speed, the skill, everything. One word: consistency. Like he would, he would score a hat trick against Montreal and then disappear for ten games. And you can't have look. You're not scoring 82 goals. I get it. But if you're going to be a 40, 35, 40, you're going to have to score every other game. Like he's done it so far. He's improved his game. He's he's a tough guy. He doesn't back down from anybody. Like he'll get into scrums in front of the net. So he isn't. So I think he's just he, he's just put together a string of games. Here. He's been consistent. He can always finish. And, and I've been a, a, probably the most critical here in LA of him because I see the potential. I see what he could have done. Sometimes it takes six seasons to get to that point, and he, he has so far. But again, what's going to happen in the last 52 games, right? I mean, he knows he's heard it. He's heard the criticism. I sure hear it from the coach. Every The toolbox is there to be a first-line left wing in this league. Will he become a Philip Forsberg? We'll see the season. And plus, he's playing for a contract as well. So to me, it's just actualizing and realizing all the goals and his consistent effort. And even when he doesn't score, you see the effort here. He doesn't disappear. He's part of the offense. Even the puck isn't going back in the net some nights. Yeah, I think when you, when you look at Kempe, you know, consistency, that word has come up so many times over the years. Well, he might be a player also that maybe evolves a little bit later than other players. Mm -hmm. You know, when you bring him in at a young age. The toolbox is set. You know, he's got the speed. He's got the skill. Uh, he's got the shot. He's got to compete in his game. And he's also learning now that he can play a complete 200-foot game. It's not necessarily all about putting the puck in the net. Consistency. So with confidence, I find him more consistently getting chances this year than he has in the past. So some of it has to do with your playing with Kopitar, who's your best puck mover. So he's going to put you in a situation. Uh, shoot the puck with shots, you know, and he's not looking over his shoulder now like he did maybe a few years ago. He's intimidated, like, I got to look for Dustin Brown. I got to look for Andre Kopitar. I got to pass the puck to Drew. He's taking a more of an alpha type of role on where he's taking charge. He's the one that's driving the engine some nights. You know, even when he's on the ice with Kopitar, he knows he can get in there quick on that forecheck with his speed, remove somebody from the puck with a body check, and help his line mates be able to keep up the puck. So his game's going to a place where – the Kings have been looking for it to come for the last couple of years. The consistency factor is really starting to play itself out. He no doubt he's going to get enough chances to score 30 goals. And now it's just got a matter of putting a polish on it and finishes those chances. But uh, as long as the team continues to have having success, the way he's been brought up, those numbers will take care of themselves. I wish I could chat with you guys, hockey and Kings forever. Uh, you can find them on Twitter at Dennis. TFP for Dennis and for Daryl at Daryl Evans 15 next week. We'll be discussing and updating everybody on all things world Junior. So stay tuned for that. Thanks to all our guests this week, Rob Top, George Malik for joining trending. Now that was really a lot of fun discussing what and where teams and players have been naughty. I really hope the IHF reverses their ruling somehow to find a way, maybe later on, to let the women play their tournament. Also for Daryl and DB coming on, there are two pros that I've been blessed to spend some time with and letting me learn how to get better. Thank you, and again, Merry Christmas and good health everyone if you've enjoyed anything you've heard in this episode or don't please tweet at me or even our guests you can follow me on twitter at p bojaranov or the entire team at jablam sports you can use the hashtag jablam sports that's j-a-b-l-a-m sports if you want to also contact us on our website go to jablamsports.com slash contact also you can find all our info for all our guests and our podcasts for even game notes for each episode including this one you'll get guests info and links to all the things we mentioned on this show we even have weekly content articles please subscribe rate and review us on apple Podcasts, google play or wherever you get your podcasts including spotify and of course click on the three dots in your podcasting app and share this episode with three friends you know please and thank you Splam sports hockey is your one-stop weekly shop for every expert analysis on every single team we are a fun community 
bringing everyone together. Follow us on Facebook. Thank you, everyone. And to every one of our listeners, we're giving you a virtual hug. Stay healthy, listen, be yourself, and stay strong. Stay strong.